from uh, Kuma, Kuma Magna Cum Laude from Harvard University. Then he received his PhD from Stanford University, working in the group of students too. Uh, he did some doctoral uh, work uh, at the Princeton and Stanford Universities with Steve Block. And received for um, different reasons uh, a couple of uh, awards that I will mention. The APS Fallon Award for his uh, PhD thesis, and also the Boros Wells Compound Career Award in the Biomedical Sciences. He's now a fellow at GILA, a staff member at NIST, and a professor at the MCDB de department here at the uh, CU. So, okay. Welcome. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, well, thanks for giving me the opportunity to talk to you uh, today. Hopefully, I'll tell you uh, about some ideas in which we're sort of integrating uh, really sort of tools and techniques that we've developed out of, let's say, optical trapping and uh, some stabilization techniques that are easy to do or facilitated by being at JILA and applying them to atomic force microscopy ultimately to do um, some, uh, I think, some very exciting uh, biophysics. So um, just let's go over a little historical stuff. What is an atomic force microscope? Arguably, it's um, one of the most important uh, tools in uh, nanotechnology. Uh, its birthday was sort of celebrated uh, in a, a Nature editorial. Um, the heart and soul of an AFM tip is sort of an upside down, atomically sharp tip. And uh, that tip is going to interact with the sample, and there's going to be a force. And you can place that uh, tip at the end of a long cantilever, so that force is, uh, is transmitted to the cantilever. The cantilever then goes up and down, and you read out that motion of the cantilever on a detector on a split quadrant, uh, uh, split photodiode. Now, this gives you a single point, and what you're really interested in is then in raster scanning this up. And what you get when you're building up images of AFM are really topology maps. Okay. Um, you're going to get Z as a function of X and Y, and there are a lot of different modes to AFM. Um, but in the simplest, in simplest uh, uh, thing, this would be sort of a constant force, and you, you'd build up a topology map. Okay, so this is, uh, this is how atomic force is, microscopy is typically done, uh, and one of the real powers of atomic force microscopy is it's, sen it's sensitive to motion or, 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 or uh, distances at the level of an angstrom, or indeed a fraction of an angstrom. And so this is why it's such a, a wonderful tool. It's, um, it can work in aqueous solution. It can work in high vacuum. It can, uh, it's a, it's a force-based technique as opposed to a scanning tunneling-based technique, which is typically uh, good for metals um, uh, and in high vacuum. Now, the disadvantage is also uh, directly related. It's sensitive to all sorts of types of motion at the level of angstrom. So if you want to measure angstroms, well, your tip is going to be moving around at the level of angstroms. Your sample is going to be moving around at the level of angstroms. And then the image, what you're trying to build up, is going to be sort of smeared out due to these sort of real-world thermal fluctuations or environmental fluctuations that may impact it. And a lot of work is done uh, on, on from AFM manufacturers in trying to come up with uh, more clever uh, designs to, to, to minimize this. Now, um, the traditional ways to improve AFM performance is really as small or as better. So what you typically think of is, um, is, is smaller cantilevers. This potentially gives you higher signal to noise and um, uh, sharper tips. Uh, these sharper tip, it's sort of like, you know, in, in the context of optics, it's sort of like shrinking down your point spread function. You can, you can see things smaller and smaller. So, so there are leading groups around the world that are pursuing this type of technology um, of sharper tips and higher sensitivity. And what I'd like to tell you about today is an orthogonal axis on which we're trying to improve AFM performance, which is really minimizing drift. And now I should say I really view these things as synergistic because, you know, if you can minimize drift, get sharper tips, and get higher sensitivity, all these things add. And you get to be able to see smaller features with higher spatial resolution, with higher temporal resolution, all of which are, are, are clearly desirable for a, a number of different types of systems. Now, um, just to put AFM or scanning probe microscopy in a, in a broader con context, um, it, it's used for lots of different types of things, okay? So scanning probe microscopes are very important, not just in biophysics. There's chemical force microscopy. Um, there's, a, a, there's electrostatic force microscopy. There, there are things that people use for looking at disk drives. There's a lot of real practical uh, things over nanoscience and nanotechnology. 
Um, but you know, uh, my, my interest is really much more uh, is driven by what 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 are the biological prop problems that we can we can look at. And indeed, in atomic force microscopy for AFM based uh, stuff, or I mean bio related stuff, it's really broad. I mean, you can use AFM as a high resolution microscope, and you can combine it with optical microscopes and learn interesting things about mechanical properties of individual cells. And radially outward, you can look at, at sort of different types of things to find your pet favorite biological process. So AFM is being increasingly used in the biological context, but it, it, it's certainly not as quantitative a, as it could be, um, and uh, hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll help uh, address that. Um, the, uh, this AFM image is really what got me uh, started in doing atomic force microscopy, because you know, generally uh, AFMs of a lot of bio things have sort of been somewhat blobology. You sort of see a, 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 thin, a, a, a thin line of DNA and a protein that's blobbed onto it, and that's all you see. And here are pictures of uh, our membrane proteins, and you're getting down to the point where you can sort of uh, discern you know, how many of these membrane proteins, so each of these blobs is actually a, a single protein, and, 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 and they form complexes, this is, and this is the light harvesting complex. And so this is what is you know, involved in sort of photo, uh, photosynthesis type reactions. And so you can sort of see that they're, 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 they're large structures, they're small structures, uh, how these structures change as a function of, of, of light. Well, if you can't actually see what the structures are uh, in their native environment, you're not going to understand how uh, the, 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 the plant responds to changing, changing uh, light levels. And, and this is, so so this, this particular image got me excited. I, and I actually started reading the details of how they did uh, this image. And, and um, basically, what they had to do is they had to scan very, very, very fast. Okay. Um, that to get this sort of now just at the level of sub nanometer resolution imaging, um, they had to scan the tip very fast back and forth. And now we can talk about, or you know, I have slides on what really you know the signal to noise issue is about why you want to scan fast. But basically, uh, I can draw an analogy to taking pictures. Okay, so if you you know this is a picture of my license plate at twilight, and if you take a you you, you take a picture. Uh, with a camera at low light level where you sort of starve for signal to noise, that's sort of your traditional AFM image. There's not a lot of high signal to noise. There's, and, and you can see that, well, you can't really read the license plate here. It's grainy. Um, but that's a fast shutter speed. So you know, in cameras, what do we do? You, you, you take a slower picture, um, and you can start to see that it's not as grainy because there's not as essentially as much read noise on your, on your CCD. But, so it's smoother, but it's blurred out. Okay, and if you take an AFM image that's slow but unstabilized, you can see your nice round gold dot. This was a five nanometer gold bead is now oblong. Okay, there's just drift in the instrument, and so slow and unstabilized uh, doesn't do it. But if you actually, you know, you know the solution for photography, you want to keep the tip stable with respect to the sample. Okay, and you know, use a tripod, and you can clearly read the license plate. You can read that it's from Colorado, and you can read, in fact, that next month I have to. Uh, register my car, re-register my car. And so you get a lot more detail by being able to average. Okay? And, but by being able to average requires the ability to hold the tip stable with respect to the sample. And that's really the question that we set out to address. And so hopefully I'll convince you that that's, that's useful. Now, there's another type of experiment that, that a biologist would really want to do. And so you've got this same image, and this is from Simon Schering's lab. Um, this is in our own work. Um, so, so you build up an image by scanning back and forth. Okay, now what you would like to do is to be able to return to a particular feature, let's say a protein, and watch it open, close, open, close. You'd like to watch it undergo conformational changes because you know it may have taken you a huge amount of time to find this really exciting thing. And what you want to do is instead of taking an image-based acquisition, you want to bring the tip back, park it on top, and measure conformational dynamics in real time at a single point. Well, that requires what we would call is registration. You've got to bring it back to the same point. Well, in, 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 in modern AFMs, you can't do that. It'll drift off. Okay? You're not going to be able to bring the point back to the same nanometer scale feature or sub-nanometer scale feature and read out its dynamics as a function of time. And so registration is also an important issue uh, in, in, in biology and types of experiments that you would like to do. Okay, so, um, you know, a few years ago, my lab had no prior history in atomic force microscopy. We, we um, were an optical trapping lab um, by, uh, from, from an historical point of view, and we set up assays that looked like this. So let me brief you on sort of the technology that we're going to develop, because basically what we did is we developed a set of technology for optical traps, and then we're going to take that sort of 
laser-based technology and transplant it onto atomic force microscope, and hopefully I'll, I'll convince you that it, it's in fact very useful. So, you know, this is a typical optical trapping experiment. This is a, a focused laser beam. It would be like, you know, a 1064 laser beam with, let's say, 100 milliwatts. And as the laser power goes up and down, you see the intensity change. What we're really doing is we're pulling on a DNA molecule. There's a hairpin. This is a biological structure that can fold and unfold, fold and unfold. And this is actually the real signal. It opens, it closes, it opens, it closes, it opens and closes. And if you hold this at constant force, you can watch these things flicker, open, close, open, close huge wealth of dynamical information that you would like to get. So, you know, conceptually, you'd love to be able to do the same thing with an AFM tip, watch a protein open, close, open, close. In fact, you know, there are ion channels. Uh, 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 patch clamp does this for ion channels. And so, uh, but when you're setting up these experiments, we find out that we're very sensitive to drift. Okay, that, you know, this scale here is about 20 nanometers, but, you know, my, my lab is very interested in watching enzymes walk, walk along DNA, and we want to watch them move along DNA with one base pair resolution, one base pair being sort of the fundamental unit of the DNA uh, helix. Well, one base pair corresponds to three nanometers. So if you're going to watch something move on the scale of, I mean, not three nanometers, three angstroms, um, if you're going to watch something move on the scale of uh, three angstroms, you better stabilize your sample uh, at the level of perhaps an angstrom to have some sort of real uh, signal to noise. And so the problem that we had was that our, our sample was drifting all over the place. And so in general, our solution was to take a, a laser beam now with only, let's say, half a milliwatt of laser power, not uh, hundreds of milliwatts of laser power, and scatter it off a fiducial mark. This fiducial mark can be a stuck bead. Well, we tend to now use silicon disks because uh, they're really well stuck to the sample and they're easy to fabricate. Um, but we're going to track the surface in three dimensions, and we're going to stabilize it. And, and this type of really nice, long baseline where it's very flat is actually uh, really important uh, in, in these types of experiments, and it was enabled by this type of technology. So let me go, let me go over that a little bit, bit historically from, um, for, for people who haven't seen me talk before. So the basic idea is you have noise in these types of instruments, and, you're, and, you're, and, you're, and your question is, where is the noise? What's the problem? Okay. Well, you know, if you're looking at a bead stuck on a surface, well, there are two possibilities. The bead's moving around, or the laser's moving around. Okay? And you don't know which one's the problem, because you're down at level of a nanometer. You're really pushing this technology. Where's the noise? And so we came up with a rather simple, uh, simple diagnostic. We took two laser beams. Okay, now each with about half a milliwatt of laser power in them. These aren't trapping laser beams, what we would call detection laser beams. And we look at one bead. So if these two signals are uncorrelated, then the problem is the laser beams are moving all around. Because, okay. Whereas if uh, the two laser beams are stable with respect to each other and the stage is moving around, well, then the sig signals match. Okay. So we basically work to get the differential pointing noise of these two laser beams down to the level of below an angstrom now, I'll show you. And we get to the point where the stage noise dominates. OK, so that, uh, that's the basic goal. And we, we, we published this initially a while ago, two laser beams looking at two beads. Uh, the reason we looked at two beads is that if the beads are rocking back and forth, you're not really looking at the substrate. And you can see that, well, both laser beams are moving, see a lot of drift. And this is a typical drift rate. you know. Uh, you know, six to ten or twenty nanometers over a minute for an optical trap, uh, optical microscope is actually really quite stable. But if you t use both of these laser beams, you you see you can take the difference between these and you can keep them stable to half a nanometer over 60 seconds. Now, remember, we were trying to look at steps of enzymes moving along DNA, and there are periods in here in which it's very stable. And so, if it, there was a step, 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 you could resolve that. Okay, and so. Um, this is sort of the core founding technology. The idea is both of these, we're setting up a differential local optical reference frame. The key concept here, these two laser beams are stable with respect to each other. And so if they move back and forth a little bit, well, that's okay, because eventually servo loops, as I'll show you, will take out that sort of motion. Now, what might not be immediately obvious is that using a quadrant photodetector, you can get three-dimensional information. Okay, usually when we think of an interferometer, we set up a reflector, we, 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 we have a beam splitter, we have a reference, we pick up one dimension per interferometer. Well, we can actually get three-dimensional information from a single laser beam. So, well, moving back and forth, moving the fiducial mark with respect to the laser beam, well, you can see that it moves back and forth on the quadrant photodetector now in and out of the plane, which you won't see the motion, it moves them up and down, but actually, because this is a focused laser beam and there's a gooey phase shift right here, 
when this moves up and down with respect to the laser focus, we actually get an intensity change on the quadrant photodetector. So we actually use the sum signal as a, a, a Z motion. Now, um, now that means this, that there's a small ripple sitting on top of a large DC component. Okay, so um, it's a small interference effect, and we had to actually use uh, some technology that was developed in, in Jan Hall's lab. We're going to use some very fast feedback loops for intensity stabilization, and this is really where doing biophysics agila uh, facilitated things. So, what, basically, what we're going to do is is we're going to set up a stabilized output. And so we want really stable laser beams. So if you have mode noise, that's going to show up on a quadrant photodetector as a position displacement. Okay. If you have pointing noise, that's going to show up as, 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 as an, uh, a, a displacement. Intensity noise will actually show up as a Z displacement. And so we're going to take mode polarization and pointing noise and turn them all into intensity noise, sample that and uh, the output intensity, and put it in a feedback loop that goes around about 200 and uh, 50 kilohertz, and then we're going to get a really stable output. So that's sort of the core idea. We're not going to identify every individual bit of noise and minimize it. We just design a set of optics that, with, with that, that are ultimately going to make our laser beams very stable. So what does that do for us? I told you we were most sensitive to intensity in Z measurements. So before we institute this type of thing, if we, we, we turn this feedback loop off, well, we're measuring the position of, uh, of the sample in Z as a function of time. And you can see here that we're going up and down on short time scales by 4 or 5 nanometers. We have a long DC drift of about 10 nanometers. So there's a lot of noise. So if we turn on the intensity stabilization, all of a sudden we get the green curve here. Now we can measure Z motion for the first time uh, in an optical trapping instrument to, better than, to an angstrom level um, so now we can do X, Y, and Z at the level of an angstrom. And this is really empowered by the fact that we have good feedback loops. Okay. So now um, that was sort of on, on the laser detection side. So now we're going to take a laser beam. We're going to focus it down. Um, we're going to scatter off one of these fiducial barks, and we're going to detect it. And then we're going to put it inside a feedback loop to a PZT stage. Now this PZT stage moves in X and Y and Z. It has its sort of own loop closed loop controller, but we're going to tell it which way to move. And now characterizing how well your feedback loop is doing by measuring this delta x inside your feedback loop is a really bad way to characterize the performance of your feedback loop. So we actually use a second laser beam to independently measure how well we're doing. Okay? And then we're, what we're, all the plots that I'm going to show you generally about stabilization are going to have an out of what I would call an out of loop characterization. OK, so we take this out of loop monitor and we can plot position. Position is a function of time and x, y, and z. Now plus or minus 1 nanometer, tens of seconds. This is at room temperature uh, in liquid. And you can see that we, we achieve sort of one angstrom stability in x and y and z. So we have a, a sample now, a microscope, that's stable at the level of an angstrom in all three dimensions. OK, now for optical trapping experiments, OK, if you look at the raw detector output, Okay, if you, if you look at the full bandwidth of what's going on to your quadrant photodetector, well, for, for a, a soft, a medium, and a, and a stiff optical trap, well, you know, you might have plus or minus 30, 20, or 10 nanometers of motion. This is hardly angstrom scale motion. So in optical trapping experiments, the secret for measuring a base pair is basically keeping your instrument stable and being able to average. Okay, and this is really what we want to ultimately bring to the atomic force microscope, because they have the same sort of thermal uh, uh, and environmental noise that optical traps have. And well, you know, we can, we can average down to uh, a tiny uh, 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 resolution. So here's the integrated noise of our instrument as a function of, of uh, sort of bandwidth. And the dashed red line here is the theoretical limit. Now I should state this is half an angstrom. This is another half an angstrom. So this is in angstroms, not nanometers. And so we're now uh, half an angstrom off the theoretical limit for how well you could detect the, 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 the location of a, center op a single object. And in fact, we're well below an angstrom at lower frequencies. Okay? Nonetheless, we started with relatively high, large magnitude so this all requires good DC stability. So people may say, oh, I can detect something at an angstrom in a millisecond. Yeah, but for most biological types of applications, being able to detect an angstrom in a millisecond doesn't do you any good if you don't have the DC stability to average out the dominant thermal noise that's in the system. There's a lot of thermal noise in these systems that are, are in liquid. Okay. 
So um, we, we put this together into an optical trapping microscope where we stabilize the stage. Uh, we have a DNA molecule. We're going to put some tension on it. And bef before we put on the servo loops, you can see that each of these green lines is a base pair. Uh, it goes up and down. You're not going to be able to measure one base pair of steps. You turn on the stabilization, and now the instrument can resolve one base pair motion. So now we've got an instrument that can get down to the level of a base pair uh, through active stabilization. So we were writing up this work, and we were trying to figure out, OK, um, well, what, can, what, what else is this good for? And we, we really uh, decided that we were, we were very interested in applying this to atomic force microscopes, because you know, while the number of labs around the world that want to measure um, biological motion with optical traps, the angstrom level, you know, a, a dozen, a few dozen. But the number of people using AFMs at room temperature would really love uh, an ultra-stable AFM at room temperature is a lot higher. And so, so the basic concept uh, is, is still the same. We've got two laser beams. Um, they're going to form a local differential reference frame. So, um, so we're going to measure the noise in the instrument just 5 or 10 microns away from where we're actually doing the measurement. So um, I can find my cursor. Um, so, so now what's going to happen here is the laser beam is going to come up from the bottom through the sample. And now we're going to have to pick up a backscattered signal. So this is very different from what we have with an optical trap. And I'll, and I'll work you through why we had to do that. So what you're going to really do, again, is you're going to measure the position of this fiducial mark relative to the laser focus. Okay? So the laser focus is really uh, uh, the stability of that is really what's going to matter. Now we're going to use another laser beam to measure the tip with respect uh, to its laser beam. Um, and you know there are lots of reasons why people said this wasn't going to work because basically you're scattering a laser beam off an atomically sharp tip, and, you're, and the argument was you're, you're not going to get any any light back. Uh, but in fact, you can get a significant amount of light back. And then the whole thing works because these two laser beams are stable with respect to each other. And now uh, for our AFM work, we sort of improve this so the differential st pointing stability of these lasers is now at the level of 0.1 angstrom. So for all basically biological things that we care about, this laser this laser reference frame is just almost dead still, and everything all all, all types of other types of noise are 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 are, are larger at the moment. Um, okay. So any questions on that? Because that that's sort of that's going to be sort of key to everything else. So are those yeah, they're CW lasers. So these are just, uh, right now, they're sort of 785, 810, 850, sort of near IR, which basically, you could use a lot of different things. Like if we wanted this substrate to be silicon, we would go to 1.3 microns or 1.5, so the laser beams would actually go through them. But uh, we come from a trapping background, so we basically had, these were our trapping detection lasers that we sort of stole from a, one project and assigned them to a different project to see if the whole thing would work. Okay, so now in a typical optical trapping experiment, the laser beam comes in through the objective, interacts with a, a bead, and then a, a condenser will collect that light, and you go on to this quadrant photodetector. I sort of walked you through what happens. Now, if we're going to put an AFM here. The problem is that uh, the AFM is sort of going to occupy half of space ab above the sample. And so our detector for our laser stabilization uh, optics uh, just went away. Uh, and so now the laser beams are going to come in, and we put a what we do we call backscattered light detection. The light's going to come in, interact. We're going to pick up the backscattered light and project that onto a, a quadrant photodetector. So we had to develop a set of, of, of new optics to do that. And let me, uh, since this is an optics type of audience, let me walk you through what those optics are. So we're going to take these stabilized lasers that I told you about, where there's the intensity noise. And um, we're going to take two different color lasers and co-launch them from a single fiber. Again by launching both lasers from a single fiber, the pointing noise associated with the fiber is now common mode to everything else. Okay, Because if, if my two laser beams move back and forth a little bit because the fiber tip is moving back and forth, it doesn't bother me. It's only differential noise that bothers us. So we actually keep this path length where we actually split the two laser beams relatively um, sh uh, short in distance. And we have two laser beams that allow us to uh, steer the uh, laser light in the sample plane. The laser light's going to come in. It's going to go through a polarizing beam splitter and a quarter wave plate. So this is going to make it circularly polarized here. And the backscattered back light will end up having the different polarization. So we can now actually collect about 9% of the light that went into the microscope, comes back out, and gets onto our quadrant photodetector. So that we can still do this type of detection 
with backscattered light with, with less than a milliwatt of, of laser power, and that's, that's really important. And then we're going to take that sort of optical signal and have electronics and computers and feed it back to the stage. And well, how well can we do in this backscattered detection? Well, we can do as well or arguably better than we can do now with the traditional type of detection that people have used for optical traps. So position now, plus or minus one nanometer, 100 seconds. The data is averaged to, to 10 hertz. Uh, and what you see, again, X, Y, Z uh, is stable at the level of an angstrom. And in fact, um, Allison, who's sitting in the, in the, back, in the back here, uh, worked hard to develop FPGA control, um, where uh, we now use, instead of standard lab view, we use FPGAs to control it. So we have much faster and more deterministic t timing. And now um, this, is, this, is, this, is, this is two angstroms up, two angstroms down. And now the data I just showed you was this gray data. And now with FPGA control, we can actually get down and control the low frequency position of a stage down at the level of a tenth of an angstrom. Okay, so, so we have an incredibly uh, stable system for measuring. And now I should mention, this is an out-of-loop measurement. This isn't the in-loop measurement. Okay, it's an out-of-loop measurement for how well we're doing. Um, and so we can hold the sample incredibly stable over a rel Okay, so this is what our AFM looks like. It's a custom-built AFM. We've never done AFM before. Um, so we basically built it sort of like an optical trapping microscope, and then it sort of evolved. But this, this, this red unit here is the AFM assembly. Um, the bottom part is sort of one of our traditional uh, optical trapping instruments, though it's been rigidified a lot. So I've told you that we could use backscattered light to detect sample position, and now what I have to do is show you that we can use these laser beams to track an AFM tip, because what really we want to do is stabilize the AFM tip. So now we've got the laser beam coming up, and we're going to measure the position of the AFM tip. And this is really complementary, I'll show you, to the traditional cantilever deflection. So this is really measuring something very different. I would argue this measures position, and this measures force. So now can we get good optical signals off of this? Well, here's our quadrant photodetector signal as a function of the tip. So we're going to scan the tip through the laser beam. Uh, this is the X signal. OK, it's nice and linear. The Y and Z signals, or the off-axis signals, are relatively flat. Um, so we have high-quality optical signals. Uh, and we can use those high-quality optical signals to, in these feedback loops to control tip position. Now, again, this tip position is measured by an out-of-loop detector. Uh, X, Y, and Z, well, how well we're doing, this is we're, we're now uh, below an angstrom. And in fact, we can stabilize the average tip position to about a third of an angstrom. And so this is a fraction of an OH bond lift. Okay, and this is very different because, first of all, this is at room temperature and air. And now, for the first time, you're controlling the X, Y, and Z position of a tip. Okay, you're not measuring something relative like deflection. I'll show you our, and I'll, uh, uh, that we can actually measure the absolute position of these things. Now, all this work we were, was really predicated on being able to improve image resolution. Or I should say, <clears throat> what we're really going to do right now is show you that we can improve the quality of the image, the signal to noise in the image. Um, and so typical scanning parameters would be about 0.2 milliseconds per pixel. You're rapidly scanning back and forth to build up an image. Now, for these initial images, first, because we were new to AFM and we're going to take really long uh, Im we're image over a really long period of time, we used a 5 nanometer gold bead on glass. So this isn't perhaps the most uh, sexy of things to start with, but um, is really robust. So, so if, if, if we slow down the image acquisition time, so we dwell at each pixel for a longer period of time, you can see that there's a visually evident improvement in signal to noise. Okay, and you can quantify that, and in fact, it's a five-fold signal to noise improvement. Now, um, what this set of images doesn't show you is, in fact, that what we were, that there's an underlying stability. This just shows you that, uh, that that the image quality got better. So, to show you stability, we're going to take that same five nanometer gold bead and image it continuously in contact mode over over 80 minutes of time. And so unless you do atomic force microscopy, this is a really boring set of images because you see a blob, and then basically it doesn't move. And that's exactly the point. It doesn't move. Um, so over, over more than an hour of imaging at room temperature in air, so no, uh, uh, nothing seems to move. And so how can you quantify that? Well, you can take this image and cross-correlate it into this, this image, and cross-correlate it into that. And you can take the cross-correlation, and then you can actually track the peak of that cross-correlation and plot it as a function of time. So position is a function of time. And here's x, here's x motion, here's y motion. And you can see that over the course of this 80 minutes that we've drifted by about four angstroms, 
and x and y. So this is we're really stable now, uh, below cer certainly below a nanometer over over an hour at room temperature. And what do, what does this correspond to? Well, the residual drift rate of the instrument is about five picometers per minute. Okay, uh, this is a, a ridiculously small unit. It's very close to the best that people have ever done in scanning tunneling microscope, which is about one picometer per minute. But that's really at ultra high vacuum. Uh, in, at, 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 at four degrees uh, Kelvin. And so now we're really at these sort of more biologically useful conditions. Uh, we're at room temperature. Um, I should say this, this represents, this, at room temperature, this represents about a hundredfold improvement over current state of the art, which is sort of based on an image acquisition feed for type of system uh, that, that was uh, put forward by, by, by these authors. Um, so uh, we, we were very excited because this actually got featured in Science, that after sort of years of being told, no, no, this won't work, this won't work, we actually got it published. And then uh, an editor of Science uh, uh, liked us. Um, and so we, 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 were, we, were, we were very pleased uh, about that. Um, so imaging is just one aspect. You know, Improving sort of imaging is one aspect that's important for biological application. Controlling force is actually very important, too. So, so this is an image of a microtubule taken with atomic force microscopy. Um, and uh, if you press a little too hard, you can crush it. Okay, so, so these types of forces, you know, you, know, you say 300 picanewtons, well, that's 0.3 nanonewtons. And for an AFM person, well, that seems like a, a relatively modest force. For a person who's a biophysicist by training, this, this really reminds me of sort of imaging toasters with sledgehammers that you're just going to crush it. And so there's a huge debate in the field about, you know, if you can't control force really well, you're just going to crush the biological molecule or at least distort it. But actually, you can use that distortion to actually learn new information. So he here's a membrane protein called aquaporin. And here's your, you can sort of start, just start to see sort of interesting internal structure. And then if you push a little bit harder, you actually see a new symmetry appearing in the image. So now you can actually, if you can control force, OK, and you can build up signal to noise, you can now take topology where you're not just taking the light topology. You can press down, look a little bit lower, press down, look a little bit lower. And so you know, there, there's a lot of interesting uh, biological information to be had if the force is controlled. OK. So um, you know, it's clearly uh, our motivation is, 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 in, is in biophysics, but the implications for this type of technology uh, and nanoscience and nanotechnology is certainly pretty obvious. I mean, we can use these fiducial marks, which are really local reference guides, to make registered motions to almost any point on, on, on a wafer scale size device. Because all, all, you know, we can center on this, and everything, therefore, af off that is a small scale registered motion. And so we think you can get sort of atomic scale registration or nanometer scale reg registration over arbitrarily large distances, where the biggest problem is probably going to be the um, asymmetry at the apex of the tip. The fact that each tip is slightly different is probably going to be the biggest, the biggest problem. So you, could, you can certainly repeatedly probe the same individual nanometer scale feature over, over arbitrary log regions. And you can come back to that point, And that's what's very important. OK, so what, what, what's got us excited on the biology front? What, what are we, where, where are we moving towards? Well, we, we started off with this idea that we wanted to take better images. Okay? Uh, so you can take images slower. You can build up high resolution images. We want to look at conformational dynamics. We want to watch, let's say, ion channels open, close, open, close. This would really uh, uh, be very exciting. And, and there's this concept which is called force spectroscopy, which is uh, where you pull molecules apart. You mechanically unfold individual molecules. And actually, after going to a conference and talking to people, we realized that this was probably the lowest uh, level scientific fruit that we could sort of get to relatively easy. Um, because you, know, you find out that people who take these sort of state-of-the-art high-resolution images, only about 1 in 20 or 1 in 50 AFM tips are actually sharp enough to show you those images of membrane proteins. People just throw out 49 out of 50. And, um, and, and now uh, uh, we decided we would, we would focus on this as something, uh, as, as, as a good place to start. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about our target. What are we looking at? We're looking at membrane proteins. So membrane proteins uh, have, uh, live in a lipid bilayer, and they have a hydrophobic and a hydrophilic region that sort of allow them to bridge, the, let's say, in this case, between the inside and the outside of the cell. Um, they're very important. They represent uh, targets for about 50% of all future drugs are targeted towards uh, membrane proteins. 30% um, of our genome, or in fact all genomes, are membrane proteins. 
and only about 1% of the protein data bank where structures end up are actually come from membrane proteins. They're really hard to crystallize. They're hard to study by NMR. They're hard to study by, uh, in part because it's, it, you can't make a lot of them, and they, have this, they live in this oil-water interface, so you, it's hard to get nice three-dimensional crystallizations from them. Um, and so atomic force microscopy is emerging as a new technique or, uh, to, to study these types of uh, things. Um, first of all, you can learn about topology. You can study them in their native membranes. I showed you pictures of membrane proteins where we saw assemblies. Well, if you scrambled them all up and put them back into the membrane, you wouldn't get those beautiful structures that biology built. And it's really you know, that organization that's important to, to, to follow. Okay. So, um, so the next thing that we had to do, uh, everything I've told you before was actually in air at room temperature. And now we actually had to move into liquid. And so when we had to move into liquid, we had to come up with uh, flow cells. And we actually, uh, this took about half a year to a year to get to work really well. But now we bring our laser beams through because we need the, a piece of glass because if our laser beams go through a glass water interface, there'll be way too much noise due to the small pressure fluctuations to do anything well. So we actually go from uh, air through glass into liquid, back through glass and back out. And now if you're going to do things um, not at high vacuum but in salty solution, all sorts of types of things corrode. And we needed things that were stable but could, could support uh, doing things in aqueous solution where it's nice and salty. And actually um, uh, my postdoc, or former postdoc now, Gavin King, came up with this. Uh, he used titanium and glass actually have the same thermal coefficient of expansion. And so you could use a frit to actually bond this so it's really stable. And so we can heat it up to 500 degrees and cool it. And now we have something that has the stability that we need for the type of uh, measurements that we want to do. Now, the next problem that we had to overcome in sort of trying to do biologically useful stuff is the problem, what I think of as sort of a needle in a haystack. Okay, So um, what we're going to want to do is we're going to want to find these membrane proteins sitting on a large glass area. And so the, the, these are small patches of interesting stuff scattered over a very large area. And now the problem is if you take your AFM tip and you scan it back and forth, back and forth, trying to find your sample, a couple bad things can happen. First, things stick to your AFM tip, and your AFM tip get, okay, gets degraded because it's no longer as sharp. Um, two, your AFM tip, which is supposed to be really sharp, may break. Or three, you're scanning really fast and you crush the biological molecule that you're looking at. So there are a lot of problems with trying to find these rare targets of interest in a large sample area. So I actually, we, we came up with a, a relatively efficient way to do it that we can is label free in the sense that there's no fluorescence involved. It's tip free. There's no, um, we're not using AFM tip, so we're not degrading. Uh, the AFM tip, it's actually, we use our uh, laser beam that's normally going to detect the laser, detect the AFM tip, and we just retract the AFM tip back, and then we use our, our normal quadrant photodetectors to go look for things on the surface. And we're going to crank up the intensity gain, or we're going to crank up the gain on the, on the, uh, on, on the imaging, but, um, uh, but this is important, and uh, we can get some really nice images after scanning. And so now this is an optical image. So, uh, so we're scanning a laser beam. You can sort of think of this as sort of confocal, right? We're scanning a point back and forth across a sample really fast. Well, these things that are really bloomingly big, well, those, those are our, our fiducial marks. But these are actually single lipid bilayers. So they're about 5 nanometers high. They're lipids. They have a high, you know, relatively high protein content. But we can actually see things that have essentially the right surface features. Now you can zoom in on one of these, and you can see, well, no, there, there, there's something that might look like a single lipid bilayer. And after you get experience, you can find out that, in fact, this, this, this is a single bilayer. And you can image it now by bringing an AFM tip down. And the AFM tip is actually, interestingly, registered to the laser beam that did the imaging. So that you know, Allison zoomed in on it here, and when she came down with the AFM tip, she landed right on top of it. So you didn't have to scan over large areas. Okay, so now there's this actual beauty of doing optical imaging and then coming back with the AFM tip is that instead of it being 4 or 5 p.m. before Allison and Gavin found a membrane patch that they were happy with, it can now be sort of 11 o'clock. Or if you have a really, or, or 10 o'clock, and if you had a really bad sample and it looks really crappy in your optical image, you don't have to spend a lot of time futzing with your AFM. You just say, oh, that's a bad sample, 
and you can do it. So you can characterize the success of your sample preparation without actually ever having to touch the sample. And that's actually really empowering. It's purely technological, but it's actually really empowering for the AFM uh, community. OK, so now, now, we can, now we're, we're in liquid. We can find the patches. Um, but then what we found out is that when we, we, we started doing um, force spectroscopy, where we're pulling on things, that your favorite uh, you know, AFM tip is you know, a nice upside down pyramid. It's nice. It's highly, it, it's highly symmetric. Well, this is the type of tip that people use for, um, for a, a very soft things. So you want to, OK, these are, these are shorter. They're softer. They have higher signals to noise for doing these measurements, but they're horribly asymmetric. So you know, you think, well, we, have, we had pretty good crosstalk scattering off of something like this, but if you're scattering a laser light off something that's tilted like that, that's so highly asymmetric, you have a lot of crosstalk. Um, and this is really uh, where computational power comes in, and so we're very lucky that Allison joined the lab, because you, you now have really serious crosstalk. So, so this is your voltage, your X signal, your, uh, and you move in X, this should, be a, this should be a nice line. But if you move in Y, you also get something now. There's significant optical crosstalk in the system. Uh, and that's bad, but you can actually, that, I, oh. um, uh, so, so, but what you can do is you can do some linear algebra where you really want to measure X tip, but you have three inputs, V, X, V, Y, and V, Z. And you can uh, write down some linear algebra to basically do a transformation from your measured variables to what you want as sort of a calibration. And there's sort of 35 coefficients. So you're going to scan 100 by 100 by 100 nanometer cube. You're going to characterize all the optical crosstalk. And then the fact that we now have an FPGA doing all this math, you can download all those crosstalks and get really nice behavior. So now we have X tip uh, determined instead of VX. Okay, VX is the measured variable, but now after we take out all the crosstalk, you can see, in fact, that the residuals are there's basically nothing systematic left. Okay, so we, we can we can now accommodate uh, tips that are highly asymmetric, and it also means that when we're lining this laser beam up in with respect to our, um, our, our 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 detection laser that's coming from below, that alignment isn't as quite as critical. It's it's still a, it's still a finesse thing. It's not something that we can we can automate yet, but it's not as critical to get the crosstalk to zero because we can accommodate crosstalk now. OK, so now we want to start pulling on molecules. OK, so, so now, so in a typical force spectroscopy experiment, there's going to be some molecule here that's stuck to the surface. Your AFM is pulling backwards. It's moving up. You're just telling a stage to move up, typically at a constant velocity, let's say 100 nanometers to 1,000 nanometers per second. And your measurement variable here is Z lever, the deflection of the cantilever. OK, and you're going to plot that as a function of stage position. You don't actually know the tip sample separation. So you can, you can calibrate this type of system by bringing an AFM tip in, touching it off the surface, and retracting it. But notice when you're off the surface, you have no information. Okay, you don't know how high you are off the surface. Now, people have addressed this. Julio Fernandez's lab has addressed this by taking fluorescent beads, sticking them to AFM tips, and using an evanescent wave to calibrate the vertical height. Now, the problem with that uh, is the fact that you've basically taken your nice atomically sharp tip and you've compromised it. Okay. So what I'll show you here is that by using a focused laser beam and just commercial AFM tips, we can now track what we would call Z tip, the tip sample separation using our backscattered sample. And so what you see here is now the new information that we have. You bring the laser you bring you bring the tip in and you see this, you get a nice readout of exactly how high you're off over the surface. You hit the surface, the surface should be incompressible because it's glass, so it shouldn't move and yep, data shows that it doesn't move. So you know exactly where this is incompressible, you're getting a force buildup. And where you see nothing here, you get a beautiful readout of how high you are. Now, there's always a debate in these force spectroscopy experiments about where zero is. So you can actually fit a line to the blue data to define zero. You can fit two lines to the green data to define zero and ask, what's the difference between those two definitions of where the surface is? And in fact, the, the difference between those two differences is, is, is essentially zero, and the standard deviation is a third of a nanometer. So now we can really now define absolutely how high the tip is over the sample. So now this is a very unique uh, new measurement, and hopefully I'll show you some of the things that we can do with that. So there was actually one last structural thing as we're moving from uh, uh, sort of 
sort of a initial proof of principle on gold beads to actually doing some other stuff that we ran into. Oh, so, so basically, we now have sub-angstrom measurements of z-tip and z-lever. These are complementary, and, and we'll go over this in a minute. So all this fancy feedback doesn't do you any good if you put the AFM tip on a surface and there's a lot of noise. Okay, we can stabilize the surface in X, Y, and Z. We can stabilize the tip in X and Y, but cantilever deflection is ultimately the readout of the experiment. And so if the, if the, if the assembly is, is, is moving up and down because of poor mechanical design, that's a problem. And it's actually something I hadn't appreciated when we started out this year. It's like, oh, we'll just put feedback on everything. It's great. That'll work. But nope, cantilever deflection is your readout, and so you can't distinguish the, the signal that you're looking for from the noise. And you can see here that our, 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 the noise, when we actually had the AFM tip on the surface, is sort of uh, is you know on the scale of half a nanometer. This was too high for this sort of molecular resolution. We wanted to go look at individual proteins, um, and so we 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 um, so here was you know Gen two of our AFM microscope. Here's a, a Nikon microscope. We had a, a a big aluminum base plate. We took off. The, the, the tower that was associated that you would buy from Nikon, and we built this sort of uh, nice, uh, nice tower, and it's, there was still this noise, and we thought, oh, it's this rocking that's killing us, and we had reasons to believe that, so we tried stabilizing it to the surface, and that didn't do anything. We put lead bricks, and we put things that try to suppress the resonance. We tried all sorts of things you can buy uh, to suppress this, and you know, a year, a year and probably thirty or $40,000 later, nothing nothing had uh, improved, and so we just finally gave up and said, okay, we're going to just rebuild it from scratch, where we're really worried about the mechanical loop from here to here. Now, this is what everyone in traditional AFM worries about, because it's the mechanical loop that, 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 that and, and this is a very big mechanical loop. Um, so we actually uh, redesigned uh, all the mechanical support structure, and uh, now when we put the tip on the surface and we have the piezo stages off, the, the noise is actually about 0.25 angstroms. So, so now we're down at the level, we're, we're only about, about a factor of two away from being able to uh, see individual atoms at sort of a room temperature and sort of liquid and type of environment. So we're, 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 we're very pleased, pleased, with, pleased with this. So this is now as stable as we need for actually doing all, all of our experiments. Okay, so what are we gonna pull on? Well, we're gonna pull on this membrane protein called bacteria rhodopsin. Um, and uh, you know, lots of laser people study bacteria rhodopsin because there's interesting isomerization of, of 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 this pigment. But it's also a model membrane protein. It has seven transmembrane uh, domains. Lots of very important what are called G-coupled uh, receptors. Uh, G-protein coupled receptors uh, have seven transmembrane domains. And so we're going to uh, we're going to use this model system because. Basically, we have new technology. This protein's been crystallized. Lots of things are known about it. There have been single molecule force experiments. So what new things can we learn by bringing our technology to bear on this well-studied system? So hopefully, um, now this was just a, a nice demo that we're making, so uh, I just thought I'd show it to you. So basically, you know, the idea is the force is going to go up and down. Um, so as, as, the, as, as you know, you've got your cantilever, it's fluctuating because of Brownian motion. Force goes up. When the force gets released, it'll go back down, um, and so that. So this is sort of going to be our readout from uh, cantilever deflection. Um, so now, in the first experiment on pulling on bacteria rhodopsin, which is a membrane protein, was done in these sort of near crystalline arrays. This is how this this protein lives. Uh, its normal environment is in these sort of almost crystalline arrays, and that's good because it suppresses the translational diffusion. Because if this thing was zooming around back and forth as a protein normally would in a membrane then it would just smear out. So this sort of...